while in Bobo di Ulasso, the president of Faso presided over what may go down as one of the most important ceremonies in Burkina Faso's modern history. Not a military parade, not a diplomatic gala, but the massive distribution of agricultural, pastoral, and aquatic equipment to local producers, a visible, actionable symbol of a country refusing to starve under the weight of foreign control. Captain Traoré, standing firm in his belief that food self-sufficiency is not a luxury but a necessity, oversaw the handover of 935 floating cages for fish farming, 1,102 power tillers to ease the burden of manual farming, 608 tractors to boost large-scale agriculture, 17 trucks and 36 vehicles for rural transport, 150 grinders and 10 processing units for sweet potato and crop transformation. What if I told you that the same land once dismissed as worthless, barren and incapable of sustaining life is now being hailed as the future of African agriculture? It sounds impossible, doesn't it? For decades, Burkina Faso was written off as a nation condemned by geography a place where scorching winds from the Sahara carved cracks into the soil and left villages dependent on food aid. But today, that wasteland has become a thriving engine of food production, rewriting not just its own destiny but the future of an entire continent. Drive through the heart of Burkina Faso today and you will see what many once swore was unthinkable. Endless fields of maize, rice paddies glistening under the sun, vibrant green orchards where there was once only dust. Villages that once struggled for survival are now overflowing with life, bustling markets and overflowing grain silos. This isn't just development, it's a revolution rooted in soil. Only a few years ago, this same land was synonymous with hunger and despair. International reports labeled it non-arable. Foreign consultants claimed it would take billions in external investment and decades of imported technology to make it productive. But Burkina Faso didn't wait for permission. Under the leadership of Captain Ibrahim Traore, the nation decided to prove the world wrong using a strategy no one expected, blending indigenous knowledge, cutting-edge technology, and political willpower to reclaim their soil and their future. The transformation began with the simplest of tools. Farmers revived ancient techniques like Zai pits, a method where small holes are dug in the hard earth to collect rainwater and compost. Combined with modern innovations like solar-powered irrigation and precision soil mapping, these pits became the foundation of a miracle. Once dead plots sprang back to life, sprouting resilient crops that could withstand Burkina's harsh climate. In just three years, over 400,000 hectares of degraded land were restored. The numbers are staggering, crop yields have doubled, hunger has plummeted, and for the first time in living memory, Burkina Faso is producing enough food not only to feed itself, but to export surplus grain to neighboring countries like Mali and Niger. But behind these statistics are human stories, raw, powerful, and deeply emotional. Take Adama Sawadogo, a farmer who once abandoned his village to work as a laborer in Côte d'Ivoire. We used to call this land the cemetery, he says, gesturing across fields now heavy with maize. You could plant seeds and nothing would come out, but now, look! His voice trembles as he picks up a cob of maize the size of his forearm. This is why I came back home. This is not just about agriculture, it's about dignity. For decades, Burkina Faso relied on food imports and foreign aid packages tied to conditions that eroded its independence. Traore's government refused to accept that as normal. In his own words, a nation that cannot feed itself is not free. That declaration became the rallying cry for an unprecedented campaign of agricultural self-reliance. New seed banks were created, stocked with locally adapted crops that thrive in Burkina Faso's climate, replacing the dependency on imported GMO seeds tied to foreign corporations. Farmers received training in modern techniques fused with local practices, allowing them to reclaim their role as stewards of the land rather than mere subsistence laborers. And the results? They speak for themselves. In less than three years, Burkina Faso has reduced its food imports by 35% and is on track to become a net exporter of staples like rice and sorghum by 2026. But this transformation is not just economic, it's cultural. Markets once filled with imported goods now overflow with local produce. Children who once went hungry now attend schools that serve hot meals sourced from community farms. Rural villages, long abandoned in waves of migration, are springing back to life as young people return, drawn by new opportunities in agriculture, trade, and agro-processing industries. 
This is a story that challenges the world's assumptions about Africa. For decades, the continent has been portrayed as a victim of its environment, forever dependent on the benevolence of outsiders. But here in Burkina Faso, the narrative is flipping. This is not charity. This is sovereignty. And that sovereignty has geopolitical weight. By breaking away from dependence on imported food and foreign-controlled agribusiness, Burkina Faso is directly challenging a system that has kept African nations economically shackled for decades. It is no coincidence that this transformation comes at a time when Burkina Faso is also distancing itself from ECOWAS and building closer ties with its AES partners, Mali and Niger. In many ways, agriculture has become the front line of a deeper revolution, a statement to the world that Africa can solve its own problems without waiting for approval or permission. And the world is watching closely. Because if a nation like Burkina Faso, once dismissed as one of the harshest environments in the Sahel, can reclaim its land and feed its people, what excuse do wealthier, better resourced African nations have? This is no longer just Burkina Faso's story. It's a blueprint, a challenge, and a warning to anyone who still doubts Africa's ability to stand on its own feet. But here's the question. Can this transformation hold under pressure? Powerful interests, from international seed corporations to regional trade blocs, are not happy with what's happening here. And as Burkina Faso moves to secure its food sovereignty, it's drawing new lines in the sand, politically and economically. This is where the story deepens. Before we move into how this agricultural revolution is colliding with global politics, and what it means for ECOWAS, foreign investors, and Africa's place in the world, I want to hear from you. Do you believe what's happening in Burkina Faso can spread across Africa? Is this truly the beginning of a continental shift toward self-reliance, or will outside forces crush it before it grows? Drop your thoughts in the comments. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe because we'll explore how this agricultural miracle is shaking up ECOWAS, challenging foreign interests, and forcing the world to pay attention. When Captain Ibrahim Traoré took the reins of Burkina Faso, he didn't just make promises, he took action. With 90% of the population involved in farming and having given their support to Traoré, he knew he had to act quickly to show that he was there to serve the people. But Traoré faced a dual challenge. On one hand, he had to tackle the insurgency that had plagued the country for years. On the other, he needed to address the chronic food shortages that had left many Burkina Bay struggling to put food on the table. So, what did he do? He launched a two-pronged offensive, one against the jihadists and another against food insecurity. He understood that a well-fed nation is a secure nation. By focusing on agriculture, he wasn't just solving the food crisis, he was also creating jobs, boosting the economy, and giving people hope for a better future. Burkina Faso's agricultural transformation is not happening in isolation. It's rattling power structures across West Africa and even beyond. What began as a fight for fertile soil is now colliding head-on with the political and economic status quo. At the center of this clash, ECOWAS, foreign agribusiness giants and a global trade system that has long profited from Africa's dependence. For decades, ECOWAS encouraged policies that tied its member states to foreign food imports and multinational seed contracts. Burkina Faso's decision to reject these policies has not just angered bureaucrats in Abuja. It has threatened a model that kept foreign influence entrenched. When Traore's government announced a ban on genetically modified seeds linked to foreign corporations and prioritized locally adapted crops, the backlash was swift. ECOWAS officials warned of regional instability and hinted at trade sanctions. But Burkina Faso didn't flinch. Instead, it doubled down aligning with Mali and Niger under the AES alliance to create a self-sufficient agricultural bloc. This alliance now shares irrigation technology, local seed banks, and coordinated crop distribution networks, cutting out foreign middlemen entirely. Together, these nations are laying the groundwork for what some are calling a food independence corridor across the Sahel. The effects have been immediate and profound. Grain traders in France and Belgium have reported declining orders from West Africa, European exporters who once viewed Africa as a guaranteed market are now facing real competition from African-grown produce. According to trade analysts, Burkina Faso's surplus exports are already displacing millions of dollars worth of imported rice and maize annually. This shift has geopolitical consequences. Food has always been a lever of power. Nations that control their own food supply can resist external pressure. Those that don't often bend under it. 
For years, Western governments used food aid as a diplomatic weapon, tying it to political concessions or trade deals. But when Burkina Faso stopped importing subsidized wheat and began feeding itself, that leverage evaporated overnight. This is why some Western media have begun framing Burkina Faso's agricultural policies as radical or isolationist. But is it isolation to grow your own food, or is it liberation? And ECOWAS knows it. Behind closed doors, diplomats worry that Burkina Faso's example could trigger a domino effect. Already countries like Guinea and even Senegal are showing interest in replicating parts of its model. The more this spreads, the weaker ECOWAS's centralized control, and by extension Western influence, becomes. As expected, pushback hasn't just come from within Africa. International agro-giants, companies with billion-dollar stakes in Africa's seed and fertilizer markets, are lobbying aggressively against Burkina Faso's policies. According to leaked reports from trade meetings in Brussels, these companies are pressuring the EU to engage ECOWAS leadership and restore agricultural trade alignment. In simpler terms, they want to stop this before it spreads. But Burkina Faso is playing a long game. Trari's administration has secured alternative partnerships with non-Western allies. The country recently signed technology-sharing agreements with Brazil and India on drought-resistant crop research and secured machinery imports from Turkey in exchange for agricultural exports. Meanwhile, Burkina Faso's AES partners, Mali and Niger, are following suit. Together they are setting up cross-border irrigation canals and grain storage hubs, ensuring that food surpluses can be moved quickly within the bloc and shielded from ECOWAS tariffs. This is a direct affront to the old order and it's making waves. ECOWAS, already weakened by political fractures, is finding itself increasingly irrelevant in a region that's forging new, bottom-up alliances. Yet while geopolitics dominate headlines, the true measure of this revolution lies in its human impact. In villages once defined by famine and migration, something extraordinary is happening. Young people are staying. And this is precisely why Burkina Faso's story matters beyond its borders. Mali recently announced plans to replicate its land reclamation program, aiming to restore 250,000 hectares of degraded soil within five years. Niger is investing in large-scale water harvesting and partnering with Burkina Faso to develop shared storage and distribution hubs. These aren't just isolated policies. They're the first signs of an emerging Sahelian agricultural bloc capable of feeding itself independently of global supply chains. If successful, this could fundamentally alter Africa's bargaining power on the world stage. But this path won't be easy. As food independence strengthens, expect external pressure to intensify. International financial institutions tied to Western powers have already signaled concerns over market distortions caused by Burkina Faso's subsidies to local farmers. Some predict future sanctions or trade restrictions if this trend continues. Yet despite looming threats, Traoré remains defiant. In a recent speech he declared, We will not trade our people's right to eat for anyone's approval. The soil of Burkina Faso belongs to its children, not to foreign corporations or foreign masters. The message was clear, this is not merely agricultural policy, it is a battle for sovereignty. We will explore the grand vision driving this movement forward, Burkina Faso's ambitious Green Sahel Corridor project, the role of AES in re-engineering Africa's agricultural map, and how this model could change Africa's future forever. Before we dive into that, I want to hear your thoughts. Do you see this as a sustainable future for Africa, or will global pressure crush this movement before it takes root? Drop your comments below, like this video, and share it widely so more people understand what's truly at stake here. What happens when a nation dares to imagine the impossible and then achieves it? Burkina Faso has already proven that so-called wastelands can be turned into breadbaskets, but now it's pushing even further with a bold new initiative that could transform the entire Sahel and beyond, the Green Sahel Corridor. This is not just an agricultural project, it is a blueprint for Africa's future. Spanning hundreds of kilometers, the Green Sahel Corridor aims to convert semi-arid zones into highly productive farmland, using a fusion of ancient techniques, modern science, and large-scale regional cooperation. Picture vast solar-powered desalination systems pulling water from underground reserves, drip irrigation snaking across what was once sand, and rows of resilient crops stretching to the horizon. The scale is staggering. If completed, the corridor could feed over 20 million people across West Africa, creating a food surplus that rivals some of the world's largest agricultural regions. 
But it's not just about feeding people, it's about economic independence and climate resilience. The backbone of this vision is the AES alliance, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, nations that have rejected ECOWAS's authority and struck out on their own path. Together, they are creating shared agricultural infrastructure that crosses borders, regional seed banks stocked with drought-resistant and indigenous crops, cross-border irrigation canals tapping into shared aquifers and rivers, massive grain storage hubs strategically placed to buffer against droughts and market shocks. For the first time, food security is being treated not as a national challenge, but as a collective Sahelian project. In many ways, this is Africa's answer to the Great Green Wall Project a long-discussed initiative to halt desertification by planting trees. But Burkina Faso is going further, turning tree belts into full-scale farming zones, integrating agriculture and reforestation into one system that fights climate change while feeding millions. For decades, the advancing Sahara was treated like an unstoppable force. Entire villages were abandoned and migration became a survival strategy. But Burkina Faso's new model is proving that desertification isn't destiny. It's a man-made problem that can be reversed. In the province of Udalan, local farmers are already seeing results. By combining Zai pits and modern irrigation, they've managed to restore soil that hadn't been farmed in 30 years. Rainfall retention has improved, wildlife is returning, and what was once dust is now green. Environmental scientist Dr. Amadou Sori, who leads a soil restoration team, calls it the rebirth of the Sahel. We were told this land was lost forever, he says. But look at it now. This isn't just science, it's hope in action. Beyond farming, the Green Sahel Corridor is birthing new industries. Agro-processing plants are springing up near restored farmland, turning raw crops into packaged goods ready for regional export. Local entrepreneurs are launching businesses in everything from solar-powered irrigation equipment to organic fertilizer production. Job creation is skyrocketing. In just one year, over 150,000 new agricultural and agro-industrial jobs have been documented across Burkina Faso alone. This is reversing the migration crisis that has plagued the Sahel for decades, pulling young people back to their villages with a sense of purpose and opportunity. But perhaps the most significant impact of this agricultural revolution is geopolitical. As AES nations feed themselves and even export food to neighbors, they reduce their reliance on imports, and with it, foreign leverage. Western powers accustomed to using food aid and trade dependency as tools of influence are losing ground. International grain markets are already feeling the pinch. EU agricultural lobbies are warning of disruptions if West Africa pivots to self-sufficiency. Meanwhile, China, Brazil and Turkey are stepping in to support these efforts, not with charity but with trade partnerships based on mutual benefit. Chinese firms are supplying solar equipment for irrigation in exchange for cashew exports. Brazil is sharing expertise on tropical farming techniques. This signals a deeper shift. Africa no longer begging at the global table but bargaining on its own terms. Of course, this vision faces formidable challenges. Financing large-scale infrastructure in countries already battling poverty is no small feat. Climate change continues to pose unpredictable threats, and foreign pushback is intensifying, with whispers of economic pressure and even covert destabilization efforts aimed at derailing these reforms. But Traore remains undeterred. In a recent speech, he declared, We will not stop until every child in Burkina Faso, every child in Africa, eats from our own soil. This is not just a dream. It is our duty. Those words struck a chord not just in Burkina Faso, but across the continent. Already, delegations from Chad, Guinea, and even Ethiopia have visited the Green Sahel Corridor to study its methods. If replicated widely, this could become the foundation of a pan-African agricultural renaissance, breaking the chains of dependence once and for all. This story is bigger than Burkina Faso. It's a direct challenge to decades of narratives portraying Africa as a continent doomed to hunger and dependence. If a landlocked nation with some of the harshest conditions on Earth can rewrite its destiny, what does that say about the rest of Africa? This is more than agriculture. It's about freedom. It's about dignity. It's about Africa finally holding the pen in writing its own story. And now, I want to hear from you. Is the Green Sahel Corridor the model that could finally free Africa from dependency? Or will global powers find a way to crush this revolution before it spreads? Because what's happening in Burkina Faso isn't just history, it's the future. Share your thoughts in the comments below and, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe now.